Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Sam Holcomb. I'm a senior director at the National Council for Mental Wellbeing and the project director for the CCDHC Expansion Grantee National Training and Technical Assistance Center. We're so excited to have you join us today for our seventh session in the um, CCDHC Child and Family Focused Learning Community, which is hosted by the National TTA Center in partnership between the National Council, the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors, and the University of Maryland School of Social Work Institute for Innovation and Implementation. So today's um, webinar is focused on care coordination as a key component of the service array for youth and families. Just as a reminder for those who have uh, been joining us throughout, but also might be new to the learning community sessions, we launched this learning community um, focused on the ideas of promoting understanding of the value of children's services and the framework and role of child serving systems, particularly for those who are implementing the CCDHC model. So throughout the learning community, we've been focused on highlighting design and implementation approaches CCDHCs and states working with CCDHCs can establish to meet the unique needs of children, youth, and young adults with behavioral health needs and their families. Um, as always with today's session, we will um, have some time at the end for Q&A. So just a reminder that throughout the session, you can feel free to share your questions and comments in the chat box, and we will get to as many as possible. Next slide. And as a reminder, um, because this is hosted through the TTA Center, this publication was made possible by funding from SAMHSA. However, all of the contents are solely responsibility of the authors and don't necessarily represent the official views, opinions, or policies of SAMHSA or HHS. Next slide. So as I said, today's webinar is going to focus on care coordination, specifically within the context of children, youth, and young adults and their families, including intensive care coordination using wraparound approach. So as you're aware, or hopefully many of you are aware, care coordination is also the linchpin of the CCDHC model. And CCDHCs are required to coordinate care across the spectrum of services, including but not limited to schools and child welfare agencies and juvenile and criminal justice agencies and facilities um, and you know, youth regional treatment centers. So we will be exploring how care coordination within the context of CCDHC and within the context of children, youth and families aligns, right? Because there is actually you know, two different specific definitions there. And then how CCDHCs and states are working together to implement these models concurrently with a special focus um, on Indiana as a case study. So those of you who have joined us in the past know that we tend to focus on um, bringing together a lot of these concepts through showcasing specific states and state and clinic lenses. So if we go to the next slide. I'm so excited to be joined by this group today. So our presenters today will include um, presenters from the Indiana Division of Mental Health and Addiction Services. That includes Thrilla Blackman, who's the Deputy Director and or Commissioner of Mental Health Services in Indiana Family and Social Services Administration. We are also have Ari Nasiri, who is the Director of Behavioral Health Integration. We'll be joined by Jay Todd Van Busker, who is a CCDHCE project director at Porter Stark Services, which is a CCDHC in Indiana. And then, of course, last but definitely not least, we have our national expert, Kim Estep, who is a division of implementation and workforce, or is a director at the Division of Implementation and Workforce Development at the Institute. So with that, I offer you to give a big round of applause in your room for our presenters. I'm so excited to, for you all to hear about the amazing work they're doing. And Kim, you can take it away from here. Great, thank you so very much. I don't, oh, there it goes. I was like, ah, my slide won't change. Uh, Cause you know, those, those fun webinar things. So thank you so much, Sam. That was a great introduction. And I wanna start off with just letting you know what we're going to talk about a little bit today, which I think Sam already kind of set the stage for us defining what does care coordination mean for children, youth, young adults, and their families, distinguishing that between uh, those family models of care coordination and adult models, and then best practice approaches to care coordination for children, youth, young adults, and their families, 
and also hearing from our fantastic uh, state partners in Indiana. And I'm so excited that I get to be here with them because they're some of my, my favorite people out there. So thank you all so much. And <clears throat> Sam already defined that CCBHC criteria for care coordination. And so I'm just gonna jump right in around uh, how we would define care coordination for children, youth, young adults, and their families. And it really is managed by a dedicated care coordinator, and it's the deliberate organization of services and supports, of course, in partnership with children, youth, young adults, and their families. And what we're trying to do is ensure continuity of care across settings and also facilitate access to the needed services and supports and delivery of social, behavioral, somatic health care as needed. And we're organizing that care to include ongoing engagement review and adjustment of the provider network or the provide the relevant providers for a family. And that's a crucial component that it's not just a refer and done, but that we're continually assessing how things are going. We're engaging providers on behalf of families and in partnership with families. We're reviewing and adjusting those things to make sure it's going as expected. We're including those natural supports and other resources to make sure that we're aligning what families get with what they need. So let's, let's talk some more about what that would look like. As systems evolve, we need to attend to the needs of the whole family and not solely on an identified child or youth who has been referred. And as you can see in our tree, uh, we, I, you know, it is what it is, it's just a tree, that uh, family members may have significant needs. And when we zero in on one branch or one person, it leaves a lot of needs unmet. And we know that when we have family units, with needs and met that it's gonna impact the family as a whole. And, and so that, that kind of shift a little bit to that ref, from that referred youth or young person to a whole family approach is really important. And then I wanna also acknowledge that there's a tiered care coordination approach that the intensity of care coordination can vary based on the need and a good system design is gonna include the continuum of intensity of support, starting with the top and that whole population or universal health promotion, which includes healthcare, maybe screenings that are typically performed by primary care providers, pediatricians, maybe schools, depending on the state. And that next step involves uh, families reaching out beyond their natural network. So beyond their family, their friends and so on, they're reaching out to the system. And the people that they're reaching out to usually sit in a system of some kind, but it could be a family organization, it could be a school, it could be a managed care organization that helps connect families with, with things that they're saying they need information around or services and supports that they're trying to access. And I know you all, as the, the topic of the day, the tiers that are probably more relevant for today's discussion, not to dismiss those, those other two, but the ones that are probably, you know, what we want to attend to are the moderate and intensive tiers in this care coordination model, that uh, in the moderate tier, the caregiver strain and stress is high, that there's multiple supports and services that are needed maybe across multiple children or multiple family members, and that the family needs help to understand what their options are. And also they need support to connect to those things that they feel would be most helpful with the partnership or in the partnership with that dedicated care coordinator. And there's the thing about the interesting thing about this moderate level is that there's not a whole lot of evidence-based approaches to care coordination at this level. And of course, we had to fill that, that uh, need and plugged in a thing that we call FOCUS, which is an evidence-informed practice designed specifically for that, for that tier. And I only mention that because it's really important as we're evaluating and as we're rolling out these care coordination models that we're attending to, is there evidence behind what we're doing? Um, and for a really long time, this moderate tier didn't really have standards or anything behind it, the, the kind of meat that our complex tier uh, certainly addresses, which is wraparound. And 
So the, the final tier then are uh, involve youth with complex behavioral health needs in their families that do need access to intensive care coordination, utilizing that wraparound approach. At this level, families may be experiencing significant challenges, uh, certainly a high caregiver stress and strain, and the needs may span multiple systems, uh, and there's not really a clear path to help. We don't have a, an answer at the ready or something that we can, we can plug in very quickly. And so this work is typically done by specialized providers um, that are care management entities or care coordination organizations. It does not mean that CCBHCs cannot operate at this level. But if a state has a design and a structure that, that does uh, include a specialized provider like a CME or a CCO, then it would behoove the, the CCBHCs to, to build relationships with those folks um, and develop some sort of referral pathway and coordination and collaboration to ensure consistency and quality for families. And we're going to talk a little bit more about wraparound and the outcomes that we hope to achieve uh, with that kind of installation at that intensive tier. So in 2021, NWEC, the National Wraparound Implementation Center, finalized uh, actually an updated meta-analysis that indicated that there are more positive outcomes when a quality and fidelity wraparound approach was used. I believe, and I'm sure Sam and Denise will correct me if I'm wrong, but we can actually link that meta-analysis in the chat, or we can provide it afterwards if you want to read the whole thing. Uh, it's just riveting information. We also have um, a, a systematic review, my apologies, a systematic review in 2017 of the wraparound research and literature. And what we found there is that wraparound approaches have been shown to increase health factors and functioning as well as permanency for youth and child welfare, as well as reduce rates of arrests and recidivism, residential treatment use and lengths of stay. Cost savings were also actualized and who doesn't like to save a little money. The important thing here is that no studies found more positive outcomes for a comparison group. And we can also make this comprehensive review available either in the chat or following um, the webinar today. We can share that with you for those that want more, more information. We also have information from local evaluations on how well implemented wraparound reduces costs and improve outcomes. And, and you'll see on the screen a few more statistics related to that. And again, it's, it's the decrease in use of residential care, uh, decrease in foster care utilization, decrease in lengths of stay in residential and so on. And uh, again, this, this comprehensive review can be made available. I think the, the point though here that I really wanna highlight is that it has to be well implemented. And so that fidelity and quality practice is so, so important. And I can't emphasize that enough. And the literature actually shows that that well implemented wraparound is pretty distinct in uh, comparison to to wraparound that has not been implemented well. And I know that Cyril is going to talk more about that um, and the the great work that's happening in Indiana and how they're supporting that quality installation of wraparound. They really are doing some some fantastic things. Before you get to hear from Cyrilla, I'm gonna talk just about one more slide and then you're gonna hear probably what you really came for. And I wanna talk about establishing care standards. And what that means is, is we need to set some expectations of how our systems are gonna operate, how we're gonna roll this out. And there were some key things that I just wanted to, to touch base with you all uh, around today. And the first of those is avoiding fail first approaches to care. We need to ensure that families can access the right intensity level at the right time. They should not have to try a few things out that aren't well suited to their needs first. And then if it doesn't work, then they move on to something else. We really wanna to try as, as best we can to make sure that, that families are connected at the right level, right, right from the front door, that we've, we've talked to them about, about what's going on. And this leads us right into number two, 
which is that formal assessments are important. They're very helpful. And we, we use them at that, that knock on the door, that, that very first kind of contact. But that should not be the only information that's used to determine need or determine eligibility, to determine level of intensity. We have to make sure that we're listening to families and that there are voices around what they think would be helpful or heard and understanding the circumstances of their life in the context of their life. That is so, so crucial uh, to getting that kind of right and, and right sizing that, that fit, which we'll talk about um, actually at number four is that, that fit. Uh, but not to skip over that care coordination is a standalone service. It's not an add-on to other supports or services. It's not staff that are doing skills training, clinical staff, so on. That this is a dedicated care coordinator who's developing expertise in those evidence-based approaches to care coordination, and they're utilizing them and utilizing them well, and we're monitoring that. And so that leads us right into that fit issue that I was just talking about, that right from the front door, we're listening to families and we're making sure that the services and supports are aligned with what they need, that it's not just about what's available or what's easiest to access, but that we're hearing those needs and we're, we're providing options for families. We're giving them real choices around the things that they feel are gonna be more helpful. And then of course, I could not talk about this without talking about fidelity and workforce development. It really is key and a core component to ensure quality and fidelity practice associated with both moderate and intensive levels of care coordination. And so for both wraparound and focus, for example, purveyor support is available around that, uh, implementing, you know, around or for implementing sites and states that would include things like training, coaching support, evaluation, CQI, and making sure that those practices are being delivered as intended. So if you're looking for a model, if you're looking for approaches, make sure that, that wherever you go, that you're asking about what training is available, but we're moving beyond that to make sure that there's expert coaching available, that there's an, a clear evaluation and so on, um, that, that we're really being purposeful as we're reaching out for support around those things. We're also overtly tracking and monitoring progress as well as variance from those care pathways or care standards that have been established. And I know you all are probably thinking, what the heck is this woman talking about? Um, so let me explain this variance thing really quickly. The, the idea of monitoring variance is that if we're going to establish that this is how the work is done, if we're going to set expectations around care coordination, uh, be it moderate or intensive level, whatever it might be, that once those have been established, we have to monitor to see if those standards are being implemented. And what is really, really important is we need to know when they're not being implemented. And I don't think that systems do enough of this with, you know, you see reports all the time about how many young people were served. We see some demographic information. We might see some outcome information. And that is great. And we want to keep doing that. I would encourage you all to think about monitoring who doesn't get that, who doesn't get in, who gets something else instead, who uh, doesn't maybe get the, the, the level or the quality of care coordination that we would expect, because that is really critical to monitor for disparities, to ensure equitable access and quality around the practice that, that families are experiencing. But it's not just about trying to catch people not doing what we want them to do, but it's also how we how we change. It's how we know if there are changes that are needed, if there are workforce development issues. It's how we know if there are barriers. Like as systems, we try really, really hard to put things in place so that it's easy for families and easier, easy for the workforce to do what we're asking them to do. And so when we're monitoring variants, when we're monitoring when things don't go like we think they should, or how we've outlined how it should work, we're going to be able to identify barriers more quickly. We're going to be able to pivot faster and really making sure that we're addressing 
the needs of, of families and, and the workforce to ensure that that quality practice is, is happening. And then lastly, and again, Cyril is on deck, but lastly, before, before she tells you about the wonderful things in Indiana, I want to talk about staffing ratios. So we've already talked about dedicated care coordinators, and these staffing ratios are predicated on the, the um, role of the care coordinator being just that, care coordination. They're not doing other things. And so for an intensive uh, care coordination approach utilizing wraparound, it's about one care coordinator to every 10 to 12 families. And then for that intermediate care coordination practice or a focus approach, it's one care coordinator to about 15 to 17 families. And again, I can't iterate enough, like these are dedicated folks. This is their sole responsibility in their partnerships with families. And so with that, I am actually going to stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna let Cyrilla introduce herself and uh, I'm gonna turn it over to our fantastic partners in Indiana. Thank you, Kim. And I love the emphasis on staffing ratios because that is so very important to provide the families the services that and programs that they need uh, for success. Uh, I want to just give a quick high level overview of our journey uh, with home and community based services, which happened about 15 years ago. In 2007, Indiana received approval from CMS to provide services under the Community Alternative to Psychiatric Residential Treatment Facilities, which is a mouthful. So we call it the CAPRT grant, um, and we received that. We enrolled our first client January 31st, 2008, um, and that we had, um, a demonstration and we had a successful implementation of the CAPRTF demonstration grant in 2008 that home and community based interventions, services, strategies provided through multiple systems of care and within a wraparound model of service delivery led to many positive outcomes for our youth and families and reducing the need for out of home placements. We also, um, in October 2012, we had our PRTF transition waiver to sustain services to those who were enrolled in our CA PRTF at the expiration of the grant. So it's always good to have a sustainability plan, which we did. Our last enrolled youth transitioned from the program in December 2016. We also engaged in a partnership with our Division of Aging and was involved with Money Follows the Person, PRTF. So it, with that collaboration, which was um, in 2012, it provided 365 days of home and community base available to qualifying youth after 90 days placement in a PRTF. The services were authorized through the Division of Aging and the providers were approved by DMHA. And we are, the last enrolled youth was in December 2016. So as we continued our journey with that, in 2014, our amendment, our state plan amendment was approved. And with that, we are so excited. We started out in the beginning with one coach, and now we're on hiring our sixth coach. They covered the whole state, um, ensuring that this model is to fidelity. And also, we look at outcomes. We work very closely with NWIC uh, to provide support. Um, for our coaches. So with that, what excites me about uh, the transition and where we're at as a state, as we look at 988, uh, looking at CCBHC and all that converging together, 
we're looking at how we can fully have a full continuum of care, especially for kids. That's my first passion. I'm just going to say I have the full continuum for mental health, but kids, that was my first love. Uh, what I love about um, we as a state being involved in oversight of high fidelity wraparound is that we can look at the state totals, we can look at enrollments, denials, the number of youth that were closed, return rates, outcomes, what systems are referring, transition, closures, and we capture that information, we can do it by counties. So if we know there's a need, it is not being met, we have the data to support that. We're also at a point in Indiana to a single site access, which I am thrilled about. So then that way we can get referrals from all over the state. It is objective and it'll go through each area where that family is. And if this is not the right service for them at this time, they can be referred elsewhere to meet their needs. And so our transition plan to have that fully implemented will be uh, at the end of this year. Uh, wraparound and system of care so aligns to CCBHC. You know, part of what we do, we go out and do outreach, we educate, engagement. You know, a lot of people don't know what is wraparound, and that term gets used in a lot of different spaces, in schools, uh, communities, but we like to say ours is high fidelity wraparound, and there is a cadence and a model that we uh, prescribe to. Uh, so it's wonderful um, because it's a Medicaid program. Uh, we have a 50% that Medicaid pays for a lot of our staffing time uh, that we have for our, our coaches and for the program. Uh, the idea of CCB, CCBAC expanding the care coordination with local primary care providers and other entities, it is so fits into system of care and looking at patient centered and looking at care plans. And we'll be able with 988 and the crisis continuum, be able to roll a lot of those um, key elements into our children's continuum. So I'm very excited uh, about that. And also the path of really trying to hone in on individual staff and who have expertise in addressing trauma and, and promoting recovery of children and adolescents with serious emotional needs. So, um, you know, when I hear evidence-based programming and when we begin to look at how we want to stand up CC CCBAC in Indiana, the thing I am hopeful for is having that model aligned and being able to provide, as Kim mentioned, staff that can be dedicated um, to provide those services for our kids and families. And we've just seen some just really good outcomes. And here in Indiana, we also partner with our child, um, Division of Our Child Services, DCS, and they also have a similar model. And also um, we have the same providers to implement um, our high fidelity wraparound as well. So very exciting, thinks that this aligns very nicely to the CCBHC model of care. So now I will turn that over to my colleagues, Ari.
Thank you, Cirilla. Um, there we go. Thank you so much, Cirilla. Um, and now if we could go back to the slide deck um, and just show slide 12, I believe it is. So I'm going to pull it back and um, step back a second and talk about where we are today, Indiana, and where we've been and how we've gotten to where we are today. Um, so Indiana uh, has been chasing integration for, for quite some time. Um, and as far back as 2013, as, as far back as I'll make everyone go, um, Indiana was one of the first folks or one of the first states to utilize the CCBHC planning grant. Um, it was a great effort that had several uh, CMHCs very closely involved in determining what the readiness was, going through the attestation, um, but ultimately it was not successful in getting us through to the demonstration. Um, the feedback was helpful, but out of that was born another effort. Indiana wanted to continue in the state and here in Division of Mental Health uh, and Addiction, we wanted to continue our integration efforts. And so some, some funds were found here at the state that we could utilize and build a grant. And so a grant was built and that was the Primary Care and Behavioral Health Integration Grant. And it was somewhat modeled off of what could be done with the grant funds that were put together um, and create an integration uh, uh, that would focus on primary uh, care um, integration with behavioral health and specifically focusing on some chronic uh, conditions. Um, now, this really got started in 2016, although the planning for this program really began the moment that the uh, demonstration um, was, was not uh, approved for Indiana. Um, and I actually joined the Indiana PCBHI in 2018. Um, PCBHI, uh, or Primary Care Behavioral Health uh, Integration uh, for Indiana, was composed of 10 CMHCs and one FQHC across the state. Um, and that was the very beginning of, of my venture here with uh, integration and with the Division of Mental Health and Addictions. And at the time, um, we would have a lot of collaborative conversations about what was working, what wasn't. There were different kinds of supports, such as housing and tenancy supports, um, and other kinds of things that were that were very successful. But there were a lot of barriers that were identified. Um, as time progressed, we continued to look for a sustainable option to 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 fund integration and and have integration um, progress here at in, in Indiana. And we looked at several models. Um, and what we really looked at is what our gaps were here in Indiana and um, what barriers we really had to get to integration, um, both here at the state level, but also by talking with our providers, what their realistic um, on the ground issues were, whether it was reimbursement, whether it was with certain staffing um, co uh, compositions. Um, but what we end up working on were, were two different models really stuck out more than the others, and those were health homes and CCBHC. Um, we really liked the work that had been done in Missouri and really were envious to a certain extent of the, uh, the, the very successive and um, intentful uh, move uh, that Missouri made over the years through different programs to step up to the CCBHC level. Um, and for us here in Indiana, it was very much about how can we continue to progress integration? How can we get closer to, to this ideal that we would like to get? But we generally found that there were some difficulties. The stars just didn't align for us when it came to um, pursuing CCBHC. And there was multiple reasons. There was messaging um, with uh, you know, our providers themselves that we worked with in, in PCBHI really understood integration, but outside of that, there were questions. Why these models? Why, why this work? How is this going to solve the issues that we have in our system? Um, and at the time, it didn't really seem to completely align, but 2020 really, really changed that. Um, for, for us here in Indiana. Um, and we were very consistent in working and trying to define what models would work well. In fact, much of 2019 was trying to identify a pathway towards CCBHC and what that would look like. And at the time we were really thinking it would take multiple years to get to that level and multiple different initiatives. But in 2020, things really started to change. First and foremost, um, SAMHSA opened up the expansion grants and uh, throughout 2020 and since um, during those fiscal year uh, awards, 
uh, 17 CMHCs here in Indiana received uh, the SAMHSA expansion grants for CCBHC. Um, this was immensely helpful in, in several different uh, methods. One, the state ourselves, we collaborated with these awardees and understanding what they were going through with their implementation, um, coordinating with them and what their barriers continued to be and where they saw their successes uh, as well. Um, and continued to carry conversations. And as time um, moved on, we also tried to determine how we could move the needle and further support them and, and look towards a, a possible uh, way to get towards um, a state certification and, and development of that. Um, and a lot of that work really became helpful by talking with our providers first and foremost, um, directly with those that had received the expansion grants and also those that had not yet um, having consistent conversation. And then furthermore, our providers have a coalition that, that they have that represents them called the Indiana Council. And the Indiana Council and specifically Zoe France, um, the, the leader of the Indiana Council, um, were immensely helpful throughout 2020 to uh, put the word out, um, not only among our providers, but also externally, um, especially uh, by um, advocating um, with, with legislature, um, that was incredibly helpful for us here in Indiana to get the word out about CCBHC and continue to support it um, in, in multiple levels, not just here at the state, but also outside and external um, with, within across our state. Um, and then furthermore, um, further collaboration with uh, the National Council, um, with further collaboratives that have been provided through Nashvid and University of Maryland. Continuing the conversation and, and these ventures really helped push it to our leadership as well as to others here in the state. Um, now in 2022, um, throughout 2021, um, we worked with the Indiana Council and others to, to draft some legislation. And that legislation that ended up being drafted, uh, we had to take a couple different runs at it. Um, Jay Chaudhry was, was incredibly helpful at making sure it actually got through. Um, it was in a previous session and it didn't make it all the way through, but in our special session of 2022, House and Roll Act 1222 um, was, was put forth. And that um, provided a legislative mandate for the Division of Mental Health and Addiction to create a report that would detail what it would look like for CCBHCs to be expanded um, in Indiana. And specifically what that report asked for, and, and these were, were specific things that, that we worked on together to have drafted into this uh, enrolled act was um, to discuss 988 coordination. So coordination with uh, the 988 initiative here in Indiana, those are direct overlaps um, as far as our division is concerned um, with the provision of mobile crisis teams and, and CCBHC and also the work that 988 does. Um, but how we're gonna coordinate with our 988 system, the call centers, um, uh, then also the use and utilization of the SAMHSA expansion grants. Um, we had uh, at this time 17 expansion grantees that were awarded here in Indiana, so we wanted to talk about what had gone on, the, the successes there, um, the potential to expand CCBHC in the state, what it would look like as far as through Medicaid and what exact pathway we would possibly take. Um, and then finally, what was included in that mandate was to discuss um, restructuring of state funding through a financial model, whether that be PPS or another financial model. Um, and PPS is the prospective pay structure um, that is developed for CCBHC. So with all that intact, that really gave us um, a big mandate and, and an actual reason to push CCBHC, not only here um, with, with our efforts and our initiatives, but also externally as well um, due to the legislature's uh, act. So that was fantastic. We worked on um, developing some bridge grant funding, which uh, we, we found some funding here at our state to support those CCBHCs that had been previously awarded and their funding was coming to an end. Um, we knew there was further uh, you know, future federal funding that was coming, but at the time we wanted to ensure that our CMHCs that had invested in CCBHC and built up service uh, 
um, lines and, and put together staffing um, that they would be supported and wouldn't lose those in, in between as we pursued CCBHC here at the state. Um, and then uh, finally, um, oh, sorry, uh, I'm gonna wrap this up really quick. Finally, um, what happened is we have nine more awardees that were awarded recently through the IA, the uh, Improvement Advancements and Planning Development and Implementation Grants. Um, that was incredibly helpful, but we are also looking forward to the demonstration. None of this work could have been done if we weren't consistent in talking to our providers, talking to their council, talking to national advocates um, in integration, and also continuing to carry this in, uh, th these conversations to our leadership. When the stars aligned, then we are all able to move forward. And now we're moving in the direction where there's alignment and um, we have a real mission and directive. I'm gonna now pass it over to Todd. Todd, I apologize for stealing from your time. No, this is great. And uh, uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Todd. Uh, I am a licensed clinical social worker and I work at a community mental health center in Valparaiso, Indiana, and have had the pleasure to work alongside uh, Ari and Cirilla and their team at the Division of Mental Health and Addictions uh, for quite some time. And Kim, would you advance to the next slide, please? So it's my goal and I have the privilege to kind of talk about the relationships up there. You see on the upper left, relationship, relationship, relationship. And what I'd like to use this slide for is to kind of, uh, you know, tell a story about how all those arrows represent the connections that have been built over the years um, to which which really represent pathways that will enable our staff at the local level at, at each provider level to provide effective care coordination. Uh, for our consumers in our communities. Um, as Sam said early on, you know, care coordination is the linchpin for CCBHC. And, um, and in my experience, when providers communicate, um, patient experience of care improves. But as you all are aware, um, when we're serving people with high needs, uh, oftentimes they, they get services from several different providers and there's real, really no incentive for those providers to collaborate. And so it, it is incumbent upon us then to make this happen as a CCBHC. Um, so this eco map is going to kind of describe the way that I'm gonna highlight with my time is in the yellow with, the, with Indiana, with Ari and, and uh, Cirilla and their team, uh, the orange is us in the middle uh, at Porter Stark Services, and then there are 24 other community mental health centers in our state, which all um, fall under uh, the Indiana Council, which, which we work alongside uh, to really um, enhance what we're doing. Uh, the blue represents data, which is really important um, as we try to serve people uh, effectively, and not just data, but timely access to actionable data. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that as well. And um, so we'll just jump right in here. As Ari mentioned, uh, I know Ari, I know Cirilla because we've interacted on, in several different ways over the years. And that's, I think the first piece, that first arrow, um, as you mentioned the planning grant, uh, there's, there's other things that we've collaborated upon and we have had in-person meetings, uh, site visits, uh, the state sponsored an integration conference several years ago that might've been before Ari, but, but the state has made opportunities for providers to connect with the state in order for them to know, uh, as Ari mentioned, and I'm going to echo um, the, the challenges, um, the, the successes um, that each provider in our state uh, it faces and, and what can we do to align needs in order to effectively serve uh, our populations. Um, several, several opportunities, and we were fortunate to be one of the new IA grant grantees. And, and I, I said earlier to our, to our group that um, I don't know that that would have happened without the consistent collaboration uh, amongst uh, Indiana, uh, the division, and, and our continued uh, uh, 
active connection with, with all of those providers. Um, the other thing that Ari mentioned and is, is an active connection with Indiana Council and Zoe, and uh, that also is a way for community mental health centers to, to connect together. Uh, they have several different committees and more recently around CCBHC, mobile crisis, uh, and some other uh, options to connect and to share what's working, what's not working. Uh, and sometimes it's those committees, um, because this work can be hard. You guys, you all know that. And sometimes to, to connect with others that are facing the same uh, challenges uh, is very uh, comforting, uh, but, but also encouraging that we can come together and problem solve um, and learn from the successes. The other uh, orange there are the other community mental health centers in our state. And there's been uh, several opportunities for us to work together and build relationships. Uh, we've had uh, grant applications uh, that we've applied for together and been awarded and worked together around uh, integrated care, around first episode psychosis. and. And as with all of those new programs and, and uh, initiatives, uh, that also brings opportunities for training. And, and sometimes, uh, even this morning, I, I was in a meeting where centers are like, hey, we need more peers. Um, and what, what we, can't, we can't get a, a, a training timely. Well, we have worked with other centers uh, and one center sponsors a training and, and, and they open it to other uh, centers in the region so that we can uh, be more efficient with not only with our time, but with the grant dollars. Um, and so that's been, that's, I, I can't tell you enough how much that has been helpful in all these initiatives. And, and that takes time and effort and consistency. And, and that's something that DMHA and, and Indiana Council and our partners have consistently demonstrated a commitment to doing. Um, data. Um, wow. You know, Ari and I have had lots, lots of conversations because, you know, uh, there's data and different, different uh, areas where we can get data. Maybe it's claims data. Maybe it's um, uh, data from the managed care. You see the MCE there. Um, uh, we have a health information exchange in Indiana, but it, it's not, uh, not, not everyone has access to that at this time. And so some communities do, some com communities do not. So what can we do to leverage that? You see the, uh, the blue triangle is our, our own electronic health record. Um, and what we're doing to uh, build um, a tool for our team to effectively uh, connect with people. One example of that is, um, we have we're working to enhance a, a, an external referral module uh, when uh, instead of just giving someone a piece of paper and, and marking it as text in a service note, we're actually having a, a referral uh, that's being made that's reflected in the medical record. And then uh, and then leadership can then follow up with that with staff to ensure that people are following up. Um, Tracking progress, making sure people are connected to primary care, um, you know, the specialty care for, for these uh, complex medical issues that, that people face. And then, of course, you know, action, the data about inpatient hospitalizations, whether that's behavioral or physical health, you know, knowing when those things happen in a timely fashion so that we can intervene effectively. So I can't say enough about the relationship part about this uh, and how that has really enabled us to, to align what our needs are, to align the needs of our staff. And there, there's so many benefits to just being in the room together or on Zoom, which we've done mostly over the last couple of years. But I appreciate the efforts of, of Ari especially um, and, um, and our other stakeholders uh, that are represented by this slide. And uh, it's just been a lot of fun, um, but hard at the same time to, to build this system and, and really exciting for us in the Indiana right now as things appear to be uh, picking up speed. 
So back to you, you, Sam. Did I miss anything, Ari? Not at all. I just <laughs> want to say the appreciation is absolutely mutual. Uh, Todd has become quickly uh, one of my one of my favorite folks to have a conversation with, and that's true of a lot of the providers. Just due to the amount of conversations we've had um, and and a collaboration over the years, uh, it's it's fun to work with with great people like like Todd. So thank you, Todd. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I also just want to say how amazing it is to just see the mutual appreciation and collaboration there. I might ask all of our presenters to come back on video so we can see your faces as we have the last 10 minutes for um, questions. So if anyone on the line has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I might actually um, just kick us off by you know, asking for various perspectives here, but specifically from Indiana, right? So Ari, you talked about this evolution over time, um, both I think in like implementation of integration as well as movement towards CCDHC. There were some really common themes there, right? Partnership, incremental progress, investments over time. Um, I'm curious if you can get a little bit more concrete with us in, um, you know, what has your integration of wraparound into CCDHC or alongside CCDHC looked like? Knowing that it's probably still happening, right? Um, but, you know, what are some of the conversations? What are some of the, um, you know, where does alignment need to be well-defined uh, within the system? Um, and how is that starting to play out for all of you? Yeah, we're in the thick of that conversation right now. So um, where that really lines up is looking, I think, first and foremost at what you will attest to um, in your certification requirements with CCBHC and working through, I think, because every state's very different. And I think one of the things that can be some somewhat anxiety inducing when you're first looking at it from, from your state's perspective is where do I start um, to a certain degree? And I think that's a fantastic place to start is your certification requirements, looking at what your state currently is doing. Um, but then in, in my mind, uh, you know, CMHW and, and that high fidelity wraparound really fits um, a very specific population very, very well. So the question is, what about the rest? What about the other folks throughout your continuum? How are you going to support them? How are you going to tie up resources to ensure that they have what they need? Um, how are you going to ensure that um, people are, are equitably put into the wraparound care, um, that you're picking um, people not just based on the, the counties that are easiest in your state, but looking at across your counties, where who is, who is actually getting access and who is not. These, these are the questions that I think I really start to look at when I look at how does this fit within our continuum, um, is making sure that we're reaching the people that really can be affected the most by, by wraparound, and then adequately treating the rest of the population with their care coordination needs. I think the outreach and engagement is crucial, um, especially when it comes to youth. And then also treating youth with the, I think the, the, the respect, and, and maybe that's not the right word, but th they have differences from the adult population um, to, to very specific degrees that so you wanna make sure that you're addressing those um, as you work through that continuum. And, and I hope that's specific enough. Cirilla, anything you'd like to, to add in? No, I think you said that very well. I think what is important, we're at a point where we're trying to plan at multiple levels, right? And so there's a work group looking at pathways and that looking at pathways for kids, where does 988 mobile fit in? So while at the local level with Todd, the work they're doing is we need to figure out the infrastructure and pathways because at some point, we're gonna have to look at all the CCBACs who have mobile. <laughs> who are in different levels and how to bring that all under since we're the state entity charged with uh, getting a model, right? So we're at different stages. Lots of fun, but a little stressful <laughs> to, to uh, be able to multitask at all those different levels. And so, you know, Sam, to answer your question, um, it's a work in progress. So I think, you know, it's like we figure out those path 
pathways, then we could say, okay, we figured out the pathway for the crisis continuum 988, where mobile fits. Now let's look at CCBHC with the focus, because we know we all are challenged with workforce. And that's not going to change when tides, when Port of Star just miraculously becomes a CCBHC that he's going to have the staff to meet all the standards. It's going to take some time. And I think um, that's important to acknowledge that, you know, we're going to hit some great milestones and then we're going to have some setbacks. So I think the relationships and that ongoing conversation is very important. I think Sam, can I just add on to that? Um, I think yes, you know, as, a, as a local provider, uh, you know, you know, Ari and Cyril mentioned the standards of CCBAC. And while there, there's clear standards, federal standards around what's required, there is some flexibility from the state perspective about what those look like more specifically. And and I feel like we're at the table with with the MHA. Uh, trying to define what those look like. And so that's the other advantage of be getting plugged in in a, in a regular, consistent manner uh, in these conversations with the other stakeholders in your state. That's really helpful. Todd, I'm wondering if I can also kind of ask you from a provider perspective again, too, what has the evolution on the ground look like for you, being someone who's implementing wraparound and coming on board as a CCBHC? I think it's it's been slow, um, and you know, I think uh, we were talking before the meeting. You know, you you look at centers that are way down the road a little bit, like you guys mentioned in Missouri, and you're like, wow, we have so far to go. But I think um, what I've appreciated about engaging uh, with with our other stakeholders in the state and with these technical assistance calls at times is is acknowledging where we are and. I think if we can do that and, and just be honest, much like people in recovery, right? Where are you and, and what's the next right decision to make in, in the process? So um, and it's telling the story and uh, Sam, you mentioned something earlier. I think you said it's not just uh, uh, providing care this, the same in business as usual with this other label, but really looking at how our systems have changed. And systems do not change rapidly is, is one takeaway that I definitely uh, is consistent. So uh, that would be a word is just stay the course, um, you know, be consistent in your messaging and stay committed to, to the goal. Yeah, I mean, I think those foundational concepts of partnerships and grace to self and grace to others, which we often talk about when we're going through organizational change, um, apply to the systems level as well. And sometimes it's it's harder to see that in that bigger scheme, but it's coming up constantly in these conversations. Kim, I'm curious um, with the last few minutes, if you have any last words from a more national standpoint for others on the line to um, based on everything you heard today. Yeah, I, I think that the, the struggles that you hear here are, you know, represent the voices across the country. I think they're, you know, people are, are figuring it out. But what is amazing is that, is that um, states are coming to the table and they're persisting in trying to figure it out, which is like, so amazing uh, to see and the conversations around specific supports. I mean, I can't echo Cirilla enough around children and youth and young adults and their families and, and starting to really see this as, as how do we support a family instead of, you know, just singling out kind of a young person. Um, and so I think nationally, the this is a timely conversation um, and, you know, something that that folks are trying to figure out and I know even in Indiana they have you know specialty kind of providers around wraparound and CCBHCs and some are combined and some are not and you know what does that that landscape look like in the future and and these conversations are really important so I just I just you know I don't know that I have anything to add other than that you're not alone in in the work that you're trying to do and and the moves that you're trying to make. Um, and so I appreciate all of those out there who are vested in making things better for families.
Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for sharing your experiences um, and being, you know, vulnerable and transparent too. It's sometimes when we come into these things, we want to say we have it all figured out and it's perfect. Um, and then I think that actually doesn't send the right message to everyone. So I hope that everyone on the line today really carries that with them, that like this is a new and iterative model that we are integrating within a larger system and really trying to align, right? Um, and so there's so much opportunity. And sometimes we just need to, you know, move forward, probably make some steps in other directions and have to recalibrate, um, but we're doing it together. So. Thank you, everyone, and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you for joining this month's Child and Family Focus Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics Learning Community, hosted by the CCBHC Expansion Grantee National Training and Technical Assistance Center. Please take a few moments to complete the evaluation for this workshop using the following link being posted in the chat. We will be providing a certificate of attendance for completion of each workshop being offered throughout the entire series. So make sure you're registered with the same name logged into each webinar so that we can confirm your attendance and the total time you were part of this workshop. Please allow up to 10 business days for your certificate of attendance to become available and ideas at the Institute. Any presentations, resources, and webinar recordings will be made available to you within Ideas at the Institute. Once you are registered for the learning community, you will have access to all the upcoming and previously recorded webinars. With our goal to support increased access to and improve quality of CCBHCs in meeting the needs of youth and families, we hope you join us again on October 12th 2022 for session seven, the cornerstone of care, building a skilled workforce. You can access the Zoom link for each workshop and download a calendar appointment for that workshop by logging into Ideas at the Institute. Access the CCBHC Learning Community Curriculum and click the view button for the upcoming webinar. I hope that today's session has provided you with greater understanding of the value of children's services and the role of child serving systems as you continue to identify and implement approaches to meet the unique needs of children, youth, and young adults with behavioral health needs and their families and their families. Thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you at the next workshop.